Okay, well, welcome everybody to our weekly IMAG MSM working group. Uh, today is March 11th. Uh, we have two speakers, uh, Robert Stratford and Veronica Zanitsna. Uh, we're doing something new because Veronica is going to be talking to us about the work she's been doing in the subgroup. So it's the first of our subgroup reports. And I hope that will be an ongoing feature of these meetings. I remind you that the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and is recorded and made available. So please be aware of that. And if there are any issues that uh, come up, uh, please feel free to contact me, uh, Reinhardt, uh, Jim Sluka, who's been doing the website of things, uh, or uh, Bruce Shapiro, who you know very well from emails. And so we very much appreciate your suggestions and feedback. As always, I want to remind you about the Slack channel. Grace Peng sent out a reminder that we should be using the Slack channel. So I'll say it again. Uh, also, we really could use help updating and populating the IMAG MSM wiki. I understand that providing content for that wiki is somewhat tedious. Uh, on the other hand, it's a good opportunity to get your material out there. And so we'd appreciate your help. As always, uh, we would love to have questions from people who don't ask questions before. Uh, we'll have a half an hour reserved after the main meeting uh, for discussion with the speakers. We hope some of you will stick around and talk to them. And so that's an opportunity to ask more technical and in detailed questions. And uh, I will provide a five minute warning for our speakers if it looks like things are going to run over time to keep us on time. Upcoming meetings, uh, next week we have Giannis Kevrakidis from Johns Hopkins. Uh, we have Ashley Ford uh, talking about uh, modeling lung fibrosis. Uh, March 25th, uh, Jacob has agreed to talk about the preliminary work of his subgroups. Uh, and David Otta is going to be talking to us as well. Uh, April 1st, Dan Yin, don't have a title yet for that one. And then April 8th, we have Denise Kirshner who's going to be talking about her modeling of tuberculosis uh, in a whole variety of different contexts. And also James Moore. We definitely appreciate suggestions for going forward. Anybody who's a subgroup leader who would like to present on the subgroup uh, we'd also very much appreciate uh, that. Again, suggestions uh, are appreciated. Uh, Bruce is very efficient once we have the suggestions and in, in issuing invitations and following up on those. And they don't have to be modelers. Definitely people who could use modeling, people in public policy, funding, I mentioned in, in, in journalism, all of these are potentially useful topics for this subgroup. And with that, I will turn it over to Robert, uh, who is going to be talking about the role of modeling in drug discovery and development. Great. Thank you, James. I'll go ahead and share my slides. And I've got about 15 minutes. Is that what it is? Or Okay. All right. I'll jump right in. So I wanted to uh, <clears throat> focus this on um, pharmacokinetics, although we could talk about pharmacokinetics and its link to pharmacodynamics because of time limitations, I'll just focus on pharmacokinetics, which is defined really by this cartoon here that you see before you. Pharmacokinetics relates dose to exposure, exposure generally expressed as the concentration of a drug in the plasma as a function of time, although it doesn't have to be in the plasma, but that's usually our surrogate because plasma concentrations of a drug are so readily available relative to tissue concentrations. So it's our, our general surrogate for what's happening uh, in tissues throughout the body. So in this cartoon here, you see before you um, different aspects of uh, the exposure profile that we see on, on the right here. This would be an exposure profile over time. This is the uh, integrated equation or sorry, the, the integrated equation that relates concentration to dose through some different uh, parameters. 
a parameter called Ka, which reflects the rate of uh, drug absorption. If you administer a drug, let's say, by the oral route of administration, Ka is the first order rate constant for absorption. And then um, <clears throat> clearance has to do with the elimination of drug from the body, CL. And then V has to do with the extent that the drug distributes outside of the plasma and into tissues of the body. So these are three key parameters that um, summarize absorption, elimination, and volume of distribution, the extent that a drug leaves the systemic circulation. So we use these types of models to, you know, they're, the, they're our working horses to relate drug uh, dose to drug exposure. Um, models that um, are used in drug development really um, are, are fit for purpose. And, and so this entire scheme here you have before, we see before us starts from really early on when a pharmacologist identifies a biological target of interest, um, and then they validate it in partnership with a medicinal chemist. They develop a higher throughput screen um, and they hit the screen to identify a compound um, that has structural characteristics that look like the compound might be druggable to eventually lead to a product um, that can be sold. Um, once you have a hit, you convert it into a lead, which is a more mature uh, hit. And then <clears throat> you do uh, optimization of that. And it's at this point here, lead optimization to an eventual clinical candidate selection where you, we start to see you know, a lot of in vivo studies come into play here and we rely on physiological based models to drive um, um, the selection of an ultimate clinical candidate. There are a lot of things that happen uh, during this lead optimization candidate selection, but um, models and in vivo studies and models that summarize um, key parameters in those in vivo studies and that, that allow us to um, uh, forecast um, human exposure. Um, um, are, are very useful. These are, we call these physiological based models. Um, and so I want to talk a bit about that. And then once we get into clinical development with a single compound, you know, we've screened thousands, tens of thousands of compounds here, ultimately to get to one clinical candidate, we'll use another type of modeling called population based modeling um, to uh, drive decisions in clinical development in the different phases. Um, so these models are fit for purpose, starting largely with physiological base and then ending with population based. Um, so I just want to say a couple of things about these models in general. Um, I, you know, the way I look at modeling is that you know these are models that um, where you have properties, drug properties, um, intersecting with physiological processes or biological processes. So physical chemical properties that are intersecting with biological properties. So this is an example. This one refers to drug distribution. Um, it could easily be a drug absorption uh, example or a drug elimination example or a drug excretion example. And I chose drug distribution. So we have um, two drugs here, propofol and its key physiological, uh, uh, sorry, physical chemical properties, it's PKA, which says that at physiological pH, um, this is largely unionized. Um, it's got low molecular weight and it's got a decent uh, octanol water partition coefficient. Um, we have two tissues here before us, brain, and um, this Q over V refers to the blood flow, uh, the percent of cardiac output every time the heart beats, the percent of cardiac output that goes to the heart and then, the, uh, sorry, that goes to the brain and the volume of the brain. And the ratio represents perfusion. Um, so how well brain is perfused, 0 0.5, uh, um, and then muscle, by contrast, much less perfusion, 0 0.025, um, because of lower, uh, uh, just well, both of these, uh, larger volume and a lower um, proportional blood flow to muscle tissue relative to brain. So it's a 20-fold difference here. Um, and so propofol, um, because it's largely unionized, at it is unionized at physiological pH, it's really well suited to move across the blood-brain barrier, which has a very tight 
um, represents a, is represented by a very tight barrier, anatomical barrier, where drugs have to go through endothelial cells instead of between endothelial cells. Um, in contrast, benzyl penicillin, also below molecular weight, a decent octanol water partition coefficient, but it's got a carboxylic acid in it, which means that it's negatively charged at physiological pH. So as a result of that, it can't move through um, endothelial cells by passive diffusion. Um, and because we're talking about the brain, it can't go between adjacent endothelial cells. So it's really blocked from going into the brain because of this negative charge and the structural properties of the blood-brain barrier. So it, even though muscle is less perfused um, than brain, benzyl penicillin largely is targeted to muscle tissue as opposed to brain tissue. So it's just a good example of uh, uh, physi physical chemical properties intersecting with uh, physiology. Um, so these types of models, um, again, largely earlier, earlier on when we started doing lots of in vivo studies, these PBPK models serve us really well, and I'll talk about those first. And any time left, I'll talk about the POP-PK models, which are used down in clinical development. Okay, so physiological based models. Um, so these are based on anatomy and physiology and drug properties, which is what I just talked about. Um, so the way that these models work is that you've got um, an alignment here of all of the major organs and tissues in the body. And this is just a, a map, a schematic map of human you know, anatomy and physiology, where we've got blood flow, arterial blood flow coming out of the heart, going into the different tissues, and then going out of the different tissues and back um, to the heart and, and in the lung again. Um, to, to be pumped back out. So you have this recirculation system and the concentration of drug in an organ or tissue is influenced by Q, the blood flow. It's influenced by V, uh, the volume of, of um, a tissue, and then drug transport across the endothelial barriers largely that represent, you know, that separate the bloodstream from the interstitial water in a tissue. Uh, and drug binding and partitioning uh, in membranes in endothelial membranes, in tissue membranes, um, and the cell cells that make up those tissues and organs um, are key determinants of concentration in any of these tissues. So these models are very useful for predicting concentrations of drug in target tissues. So if you have a drug you're targeting to the brain, or in the case of uh, uh, COVID-19, and uh, James and I have been doing some work in the lung, uh, with remdesivir um, um, to look at concentrations in the lung. Uh, these models are very useful for this. Um, they have high translational fidelity. Let me talk about what I mean by that. So what I mean is that, you know, the physical chemical properties of drugs, their size, their lipophilicity, the octanol water partition coefficient being a surrogate for lipophilicity, um, they're fractured and ionized, only the unionized form can move across, the ionized form can't move across um, cell membranes. Um, these physical chemical properties, um, they, don't, they don't change as we go from a, a rat and we start doing in vivo studies preclinical in a rat or a, no, a non-rodent uh, um, mammal such as a, a monkey or a dog. Um, these you know, drug properties don't change, they're constant across species. Um, and then the other thing too is that um, as we move across species, um, the anatomy and physiology um, is, is largely, uh, to a large extent, it's conserved. So, you know, as I mentioned in that drug distribution um, example, you know, capillaries, drugs have to move across capillaries and we have different types of capillaries and different modes as a result of those different types of capillaries, different modes of drug movement across the different tissues. This anatomy and physiology is largely conserved as we move from a rat, a mouse, a rat, to a dog, to a non-human primate, and ultimately to a human. So these models, uh, PP, PBPK, physiological-based PK models, have great translational fidelity that allow us to do um, studies, calibrate our models in animals, and then use them to predict uh, target concentrations in humans. Um, uh, so, so they're very useful for that. Um, 
the models are continuing to develop. Um, this is a, a, a schematic, if you will, or a cartoon of the blood-brain barrier. And as I said, drugs can't move between endothelial cells, adjacent cells, because of very well-developed tight junctions in the blood-brain barrier endothelium. Um, so drugs can only move across by passive diffusion, provided they're like propofol and they have a nice, um, you know, they're largely unionized or significantly unionized physiological pH. If they're not, then they rely on a carrier for uptake. And the blood brain barrier is very good about protecting the brain tissue here. So this would be the plasma here. And then on this side of the endothelial cells would be the brain. The brain blood brain barrier is very good at protecting through these efflux transporters uh, especially on the apical uh, plasma endothelial surface, uh, PGP or breast cancer resistance protein. Um, these um, expression of these transporters in across species in, in mice or rats and in humans, we're starting to do proteomic, anal proteomic analysis um, to be able to quantify how, how uh, different interspecies differences in the expression of these transporters. So these, uh, the role of transporters and, and their contribution is beginning to, uh, it is, is um, its contribution and its ability to incorporate non-passive transport in these models is growing in, in, um, in accuracy as a result of proteomic analyses. Um, so this is just looking under the hood, you know, we have here for a blood brain barrier uh, target, you know, we've got volumes in the brain for humans. We have these same volumes and, and you got the, you know, you got the whole brain volume, you got extracellular fluid, intracellular fluid, um, all these cerebral spinal fluid, uh, brain microvascular volumes, you got flows and you got surface areas um, and the, the width of the endothelial cells. Um, and then you got your drug specific parameters here, going down here, log P, PKA, charge, um, and, and then only the unbound fraction can move across. So we got unbound fraction. So, you know, these, these properties translate very nicely because the drug doesn't change as we move from a rat to a human. And then we have these properties measured across species. So we, these models, you know, um, do very well in their, trans, their ability to translate to predict human uh, levels. Okay, so enough said for that. So once we get into clinical develop, these population or PPK models enable development. They create uh, tremendous efficiencies and they're very realistic. Um, so the way these models work is you have one or uh, two compartment models, depending on how rapidly drugs uh, move uh, from plasma into tissues. Um, for some drugs, they move more slowly, and so they're best described by a two-compartment model. And the way the concentration versus time on a log scale looks for a one-compartment is just a mono-exponential, but some drugs display this uh, bi-exponential two-compartment-like characteristics. And then you can, so you can develop models um, for, um, uh, for, for, for different drugs once we get into humans. Um, and the way that we model these is in the past, you know, 30 years ago, we did it on an individual level with rich PK sampling. We developed an individual model for each person in a clinical trial. But now with computational power, we use these uh, population-based models. So I'll talk about those. These are known as nonlinear mixed effects models. The nonlinear uh, phrase has to do with the relationship of concentration of time is not linear. The mixed effects means that we have a model, two models, structural model, one versus two compartment model, and then we have a statistical model that um, uh, describes inter-individual variability across the population. These models are really uh, well suited for clinical trials where we have sparse sampling uh, because we can't get rich samples from patients when they're outpatients in a phase two or phase three trial. And we don't get times, you know, uh, for all of our patients at the same time. So we have unbalanced data. We have some patients with samples at one and five hours, other patients with samples at 0.5 and 10 hours. So unbalanced time points small number of time points, not rich sampling, and these models are perfect for real, you know, this is the way it is in phase two and phase three trials. So these models do very well. Um, they're very good about partitioning sources of variability and identifying weights, sex, smoking, 
genotype of known sources of variability across a population for a given drug, and then the unknown sources of variability inter-individual, you know, between subject variability, inter-occasion, you know, when we administer a drug to a patient, uh, you know, over the course of a year, three months uh, between uh, different doses. We can account for any potential time-dependent changes in, in their pharmacokinetic parameters and then any leftover unexplained variability. So these models separate and quantify these sources of variability. Five minutes. From, are we about time? Five, five minutes. Okay, so this is an example of, of some of my own work and, and the value of population PK. So this is looking at a metabolite, nitrite, and the plasma. So nitrate was ingested we measured nitrate in the plasma, and then a portion of that is metabolized into nitrite. Um, and uh, we see here the nitrite, the metabolite, over time across a variety of you know, for a variety of subjects. And you can see, you know, quite a lot of intersubject variability. So I built a model here that accounted for nitrate conversion to nitrite. We measured both of these analytes in plasma, and this is just looking at the nitrite. Uh, observed levels versus the individual model predicted levels, showing um, the line of identity here in solid and then the regression line and the red dashed line. Uh, and, you know, our predictions were no worse than two-fold off um, of the observed values. So, um, you know, taking this, this population model was able to capture this inner individual variability and quantify it. Um, and attach it to various parameters in our model, the formation clearance or the volume of distribution of nitrite or the clearance of nitrite. Um, these models are very useful too for hypothesis generation. You know, as you look at the literature, there are two different ways that nit nitric oxide, a metabolite of either nitrite um, or nitrate can be produced in the lung and expired. And we measured these and I'm now developing a model um, that uh, has two different structures, uh, two different pathways for, for nitric oxide um, in the lung. Um, so these models are very good for testing different hypotheses um, for how for, for you know how nitric oxide might be might be produced in the lung, either directly from nitrate or through the nitrite um, pathway. Um, <clears throat> they're also very good at, you know, this is another example, example from a more recent, uh, less recent paper um, where we could model, um, I modeled um, uh, in the literature, we had a lot of data on um, dopamine response, but not very much data on the exposure that generates that response. And so I used a model to simulate uh, brain extracellular fluid concentrations of, of, of a stimulant, amphetamine, and then was able to predict, um, the con use the model to predict concentrations and draw relationships uh, between those concentrations and a dopamine response over a variety of doses from 0.1 milligram per kilogram to 5 milligram per kilogram in rats, and then saw some clockwise hysteresis, which uh, I then incorporated into a PK pharmacodynamic model. But simulation was a key part of this because I didn't have any exposure data at these higher doses. And I used the model to drive that exposure predictions. Um, and then you can also use these models. You know, I said PBPK models can be used to go from rat to humans, but these population models can too. This is a, a less recent publication where I used a, a principle known as allometric scaling to take bupropion levels in, in uh, brain, uh, here in plasma and, and, and brain of rat, these were measured values and then was able to predict human brain concentrations relative to target potency um, to make conclusions about what is the active form of the drug, either the, uh, the bupropion administered or the active metabolite. Um, so um, these models also have different scales of representation. I, I talked about individual versus population. I really emphasized the population value, uh, but we can also look at scales of representation for the whole organism, which is what I've been talking about. But these population models can be you know, used to you know, understand drug distribution in the brain in a particular tissue, especially if, you know, if we sample that tissue. Um, they can also be used at the cellular level. So this would be an in, in vitro study. And then we can incorporate in vitro measures uh, into a whole body 
type of, um, so, so this is an integration, if you will, of uh, you know, very mechanistic uh, models uh, built on, from in vitro systems uh, and then integrated into a whole organism level uh, model um, to, you know, to develop uh, it's a very beautiful piece of work on a, on a glibiride, a hypoglycemic uh, drug and understanding mechanistically how this drug uh, reduces bl uh, blood glucose levels. Um, so that's, that's kind of, uh, that's about all I had to say. And uh, hopefully uh, I can I'll be available afterwards to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. I mean, it, it's, sure. it's, it's really informative to see a set of models that are in fact used in drug development and, and clinical practice. So I really appreciate your being willing to give us an introduction to that important area. And I, you, I also appreciate you being willing to do it in such a short amount of time. I know it's hard to cover such a big topic in such a short amount of time. So I do appreciate it. Yes, well, thank you. And, and really that was the, the, the major point that, um, that you made is that it was largely introductory. Um, so very mostly, mostly background material and not a lot of my own research. Okay, thank you. Thanks, so.